So thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk today. I'm going to talk to you about uh, B2B sales prospecting and how to build a, a powerful sales pipeline to complement everything else you're doing in your business to bring new sales leads in. Um, it's, used, it's based on phone calls and I suppose the, uh, the biggest challenge is for people to get past um, it, it being cold calling. And cold calling has got a, a bit of a bad rap. So what I'm going to ask you to do is just to give me the opportunity to share with you the way that we do things at FMG and also to present why this is such a, a powerful sales uh, approach. I've got 17 slides to, to go through today. So uh, the numbers of the slides are on the bottom. So you'll always know how, how far through we are. So this is a, an expression that I heard very early in my sales career. It's one that I really believe in, which is nothing happens in business until a sale is made. And it's so important in business, whether you're big or small, to be able to have as many channels to market as you can to bring in new sales opportunities um, so that you've got a healthy sales pipeline and you've got your business growing. So what I'm going to do today is to outline a strategy that you can use to build significant uh, new sales leads for your business. I'm also going to talk to you about why it's important and, and, and why you should want to try and tap into this, into this market. Um, <clears throat> as I said, it is over the phone and cold calling, um, but I think with by the end of this presentation, hopefully you'll see that actually cold calling is, is a very um, successful strategy if it's done well, and it's a terrible one if it's done badly. Um, but what I would also like to say is that what I'm suggesting today is not something that replaces everything else that you're doing to bring sales leads in. It's, a, it's another channel to market. It's a different way of uh, building sales leads. So regardless of, of what business you're in, um, <clears throat> your market is like an iceberg. The tip is where most businesses spend most of their sales and marketing time um, with the visible prospects, the people that they can see. And these come to them from not only networking and referrals and things like that, but for a lot of businesses, most of their sales leads come from SEO and AdWords. And these are great prospects. These are the people who have a need now. So they're on a fairly short buying cycle, which is great. Um, but they're also shopping around. They know what they're looking for, <clears throat> which is great. They're on a short timeline, but they're researching on the internet. They're looking at you and your competitors and they start to shop around and they're often price sensitive. Um, but the most important thing is they're re they really only represent around about 20% of your potential market. The, bits, the bit that I want to talk about today is the bit that sits underneath the waterline, the people that you can't see, the people who aren't coming to, to your website. And these represent about 80% of your potential market. These people don't know about you. Um, maybe they are looking for your solution, but they're not coming to your website. They're not finding you. Um, they're living with a problem that you can fix but they don't know that you're out there. They maybe don't even know that there's a solution for the problem that you solve. Um, and sometimes they're not, they're not yet ready to look. So then if you can engage with these people, they're far less likely to, to shop around. You, build, you get a chance to build trust with them. Um, and the biggest of all um, advantage, I think, is your competitors aren't talking to them either. So it gives you an opportunity to put yourself in pole position with talking with these, these people and to bring them in as, as great quality sales leads. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about how to do this, uh, as I said. And before you write off the, the cold calling so, uh, side of things, I'd like to share two numbers with you. If you had one person spending part time hours, working part time hours and spending 20 hours a week on, on cold calling for you, they put your business in front of 5000 new businesses every year. That's a large number. If they can convert 5% of that, that's 250 new leads. If it's 10% of that, that's 500 new leads for your business. Um, at FMG, in the last financial year, we generated uh, 10,874 qualified sales leads for our clients in the last financial year, which is around 220 per week. So it's a process that work, works. I guess the, the question to ask is, why do you want to uh, unlock this 80%? Well, there's a number of reasons. It's a really big market, first of all. It's also one that neither you or your competitors are reaching right now. 
Most importantly, it puts you on the front foot. You're no longer waiting for leads to come in uh, over the internet or people to phone you. You're on the front foot. You're getting to talk and build an individual conversation with prospects, identifying their individual needs. <clears throat> you probably all had emails uh, or LinkedIn messages where people say things like, um, this is what we, hi, I'm from this company. This is what we do. When's a good time for us to talk? And if you're like me, you probably just write those off. So you can look at your 80% market and say, I'm just going to market to them. And do that. You'll get a very low cut through, um, but, but you will get a response rate, but you will be able to, to reach those people. What I'm suggesting is you build conversations with them one-on-one, -on -one, find out exactly what their individual needs are, show them how you can help them and to build that relationship. One of the most important things though to, to remember is it's not easy. And, and I guess if, if you're in business, you understand that being in business is not easy. And when you work hard, you get great success. So in, in, the same is true in B2B sales prospecting. If you work hard at it, you'll get uh, good success, but you've got to take a long-term view and you have to be consistent. It's something you need to do on a daily basis. And it's rather like SEO AdWords. You don't switch that off from Wednesday to Friday because you're too busy. You keep it running every single day, every single week, every single month, every single year. The same thing happens with B2B sales prospecting. It does take time for leads to work their way through the sales pipeline. And it takes longer for them to come through the pipeline because you're engaging them earlier in the sales process. But if you take a long-term view to it, it really it will um, uh, work very well for you. <clears throat> I want to give you an example of what I mean by the 80% too. And I'm going to, I'm going to use a personal example. It's a, a bit of a stupid one, but it is very relevant. So about nine or 10 years ago, I went into a car dealership looking for a car. And in my mind, I had three specific things that I wanted. I wanted a manual. I wanted an engine that was two liters or more. And I wanted a sunroof. I came out of that dealership about two hours later with a 1.8 liter engine, automatic, no sunroof. A um, bit of a dumb decision when I went in with such clear guidelines for myself. I've always driven a manual car. I love, I love driving. And I love the feel of driving. Um, I hated that car really from day one onwards. Hate's probably a bit of a, a strong word, but I really didn't enjoy it. It was always in the wrong gear. Um, it would either change up when I didn't want it to, or it wouldn't change up as quickly as I wanted it to. One way or another, I, I just didn't like it. After 13 months of living with the car, I finally phoned uh, my finance broker. And I said, is there any way of getting out of this loan and getting a different car without um, costing a lot of money? And he said, yes, I can do that for you and showed me a way to do that. And within one week, I was in a two litre manual car with a sunroof that I held, I kept for six, seven years. So what's the purpose of, of telling you this story? The purpose is that I was one of that 80%. For any car dealer, if they had phoned me any time during that 13 months and said something like, hey, Richard, how happy are you with the car you're driving right now? I'd have had to say, I hate it. I don't like it. What's stopping you from getting into a car that you want? Well, I've got a loan. I don't think I can get out of it. All of those sorts of things would have come through. And if they'd said something like, well, if we could show you a way to get out of that loan and get you into the car you really want, would you be interested? I'd have said yes. So that's the sort of person that makes up that 80% uh, of the market for most businesses. They've got some pain they're living with. They either think it's unfixable or they're not, it's not painful enough yet for them to, to go, ah, oh, desperation, I've got to my, at the end of my 13 months, I'm going to do something about this, or they're just not looking yet. So the, the, these are the people who you can tap into and you can engage early with and bring into your sales cycle. But as I said, it's something that doesn't replace your sales strategies, your other sales strategies. It's an adjunct to that. So now on to <clears throat> how do you successfully prospect over the phone? There are four things you need to do. You need to know who to call. You need to know who, what to say. You need to know the metrics so you can measure the performance of your uh, prospecting and you can set expectations and you've got to be consistent. Um, what, you're, what you're looking for in prospecting is not to make a sale. Your, your aim is to find somebody, somebody who has a need for your services. 
So let's look at the first, uh, first point, knowing who to call. If you're going to put somebody on the phone, whether that's you or you're gonna hire somebody or somebody in your sales team already is going to do this prospecting, they've got to have a list of prospects to call. And you want them to be spending as much time calling the right prospects as you can. So I've come up with here four different uh, areas that you can look at. Under dormant accounts, what I would include there is uh, any list that you already have of prospects or potential prospects. If you have an internal list, that's great. <clears throat> dormant accounts are those clients who you used to work with but aren't working from, with you or aren't, aren't buying from you now. Usually those people, when we've done work for clients in this area and we've called their dormant accounts, there are usually two main reasons that they're not working with our client anymore. The first is they were dissatisfied with something. And when we get on the phone to talk to them, it gives them a chance to air that, clear the air, and then to start the relationship again. And the second reason is because the person who's the contact of that company has left. A new person has come in and the, the link with our client has been broken. So simply by calling and reintroducing yourself, you can begin that relationship again. So that's internal list, um, dormant accounts. One other I'd add there is that people move jobs every two to three years, which means that on average, 33 to 50% of your database is going to be out of date every year. So if you're send it, sending regular emails to people, whether it's a newsletter or it's offers or whatever it is, you'll get a list of those um, emails that bounce. And that can become a really good uh, list for you, uh, for you to prospect to, to go and reintroduce yourself to the new person. This person's left. Who's, who's replaced them? Great. Let's have a conversation. This is what we've been doing with Bob, who used to be in the role. Social media is also a great way of uh, building lists. You can go onto LinkedIn and build lists of uh, specific job roles and specific areas <clears throat> in specific companies, and then go to the, the websites for those companies, get the phone numbers, and you're, you're building a list to call from there. List brokers is also a very good uh, source of lists. Most list brokers have substantial databases of businesses in Australia. And the big advantage is they can segment those databases. Um, some people have had um, bad experiences with list brokers. By and large, that comes from either buying a list uh, from an online uh, supplier, which generally can't be um, tidied up. It can be kind of untidy and it's harder to segment. Um, <clears throat> or they've, they've not understood exactly what they need to order from the list broker they've they've chosen. So I've put four up on the, the screen here, all of whom are really good and all of whom um, guarantee the accuracy of their data to about 95%. By and large, and it depends on the list you're getting, but by and large, it's not expensive. It's only about 90 cents per record to, to uh, buy. So if you wanted a thousand records, it's $900 and a thousand records will last a good long time. Um, the other um, category here I've put uh, under Get Smart, Lead Forensics and A1 Web Stats. What they do is, and this is maybe not tapping into the 80% exactly, but it is giving you another um, market to look at. Um, they put some code onto your website that tracks the IP address uh, of anybody that comes to that, to comes to your site. And using a reverse IP lookup, they can report back on the companies that have been to your website. They can't tell you who it was, but they can tell you the company. Now in Australia, the, the data matching to IPs is not great at the moment, but it is getting better. Um, but what it allows you to do is to build a list of companies who've come to your website. So you can then call them and say, hey, somebody from your, your company has been on our website. We've got some code, some really fancy code that tracks that. I just wanted to know who that would be. You've got to find your way to the person, but it can be a very good, um, uh, good way to open up a new market. I put in MailChimp as well. Um, that's really, I guess, for, um, um, for when, when you have a list of, of prospects to go to and you've got emails, um, email addresses for them. If you email that list of people first, through MailChimp or something like that, you can track the people who um, go, onto the, uh, go onto the email and click on a link or go to your website or something like that. Those are the most, those are the high responders as I call them. So what you can do is then take that report and prioritize calls to those people in your list before any of the others. So it's a kind of smart way of getting the best, out, best impact out of your lists. So <clears throat> if you're going to build a uh, list of prospects, you want to put onto that list, you want on that list, the best um, 
the best fit prospects. In other words, you want to know you're fishing in the right pond. If, in the, you know, if, it, if we were back in the, the 80s, you wouldn't pick up yellow pages and call A to Z uh, because you'd be calling all sorts of businesses that couldn't use you. You might be calling the local greengrocer, the local uh, cafe, cafe. And if those are your market, then absolutely, that's great. But if they're not, you don't want your um, prospect, prospect time, prospecting time to be wasting call it by calling businesses and organizations that really aren't a fit for you. Now, list brokers are really good in this way because they can help you to define your market in these areas. So the first thing you want to do is define your market in terms of the companies that you want to go after. You could look at geographic area, first of all. So you might say, well, look, I'm based in Sydney. So uh, to start with, I'm only going to call companies in Sydney. Or you might say, actually, I, I provide veterinary products. Actually, I want to call farmers in regional areas. Um, it might be that you're an office fit out company. You go, well, actually, I only want to focus on the CBD of the city or the CBDs of the city. So in Sydney, that might be Sydney CBD, North Sydney, Parramatta, Chatswood, those sorts of things. So list brokers can allow you to segment your, your um, uh, their database based on either a postcode, a radius around a postcode. Um, it can be the metro area, it can be regional rather than uh, metro, it can be state, it can be nationwide. So it's a very easy way to get um, a geographic alignment for your list. You might want to go, well, actually, our sales team are based in Melbourne um, and we want them to face to face visit prospects. So to start with, let's target Melbourne, uh, Melbourne metro. Then you can start segmenting based on the industries you want to talk to. So the ANZ standard industry classification codes, the ANSIC codes, um, are a list of codes that list brokers use to break down um, the companies on there, the organizations on their lists by industry. Now it's quite an extensive list, um, but you don't have to go to the nth degree. You can just break it down and say, I want to go to manufacturing. I don't want to go to retail. I don't want local government. I do want professional services, those sorts of things. So by going through the ANSIC lists, ANSIC code lists, you can, um, you can select the industries that you want to target, or conversely, you can select the industries you don't want to target. Um, and so you, you refine your list uh, in by the, the right types of um, industry and company you want to, to talk to. Then the next one is the size of organization. And you can do this either by uh, annual turnover or you can do it by number of employees. Um, annual turnover is typically modeled data uh, rather than absolute. Um, the number of staff tends to be uh, more accurate. And you can, there is a relationship, certainly within certain um, limits, where you can say each employee is worth $100,000 worth of revenue. I think actually the figure is 130, but it's easy to work with 100,000. 100, so if you're looking to target companies that turn over 1 million to 2 million, you say, okay, I want companies with kind of 10 to 20 staff. Um, once you get big, that um, that relationship doesn't doesn't hold. But it's also, but it is very good if you're doing if you're an office fit out company again, and you say, well, look, I want to target companies that have got this size of floor space. Then you can relate that back to the number of employees that they're likely to have in order to have that size of floor space. So you can define your market by the size of organization. So you eliminate those that are too small for you, and you eliminate those that are too big for you. Remember, though, with size of organization, there are always more companies that are smaller than a larger. So if you order a list and you've said, I want 20 to 100 staff, I'm not going to say 80 percent, but a large number of those businesses are going to be 20 to 25 staff and very few are going to be 100 um, in, in comparison. So if you say, actually, my target range is 50 to 100, I'm happy to go to 20. I'd stick with the 50 to 100. You can always get a separate list later of 20 to 50 and keep that separate and see what the response rate there is. Are you getting the right size of opportunities? Then the final thing is, who do you want to speak to in the organization? Is it the head office or is it every office that they've got? So are you talking to the ANZ bank individual branches or do you want to actually talk to in, uh, the head office of ANZ? So once you've decide, de designed and defined your market and you know what industries, what geographic area, what size of organization, then it's time to think about who is your contact. Now, I'll say right at the outset with this that list brokers have a very shallow profile, a shallow depth of profiles for contacts. 
So at FMG, if we're looking for, if we're running a campaign and we need to um, have the factory manager, I know that list brokers, they might have half a dozen factory managers. Um, so I'm not going to get very many matches on that. What we will look to do is we'll define the market so we get the companies. Then we'll try and get a contact name. It may not be uh, the right co contact name, but at least we've got the, com the companies and we can uncover who the right contact is through the phone calls. Um, but what you want to do is you want to work out, well, which, which department or departments own the problem that you solve? Um, and then who is the decision maker for each of those? And who is the better or the best prospect out of those decision makers? So you might say, well, look, um, I, want to, I want to talk to the most senior person who, who would make a decision about this. And that's usually right. I would always start high and get pushed down and then start at the bottom and get pushed up. I would also say that in most cases, procurement is not the right uh, person or department to start with. Normally, uh, procurement will be told by somebody in the company, I need this, please can you go and find it? Uh, and then they'll go out to market. You want to find the person who's asking that question. If you're an office cleaning company, uh, you might say, well, the business owner CEO is probably the ultimate decision maker, but is the, the, off, is the business owner CEO actually going to make a decision on office cleaning? If it's a small company, maybe they are. Medium to large size, no. Even though they're the ultimate decision maker, you're not going to engage with them. So get the right contact level for your, um, for your product or service. Um, and then you've got to consider other multiple prospects uh, or contacts within each company. And if there are, what do you do with that? So if you offer a solution to brand managers in, in marketing companies, you probably say, well, if brand manager A isn't interested, I can still talk to brand manager B and C and D because they have different brands that they're looking after. And one may have a, a need and others may not. So you want to call all of them. And if one of them says no, you keep going. But if you're, all, if you're providing a solution to a marketing department and you're talking to the head of marketing and head of finances as potential prospects, if one of those people says no, you probably don't want to call the other one because you don't want to, to get people offside. Um, so that's how you, um, you work out your contacts and then you can get build, build your list. So having worked out who is your market, you've got your list of prospects to call, you've, you've got the, you're fishing, you're going to be fishing in the right pond. You then need to know, what do I say on the phones? We have five sections to our scripts and we do use scripts, um, but they're not prohibitive. They're not, I have to say every single word on this, they're conversational based and they're in some ways prompts for our, our team. And that's what I would suggest here. So, um, you, we have our introduction where you ask for help. Um, you have your elevator pitch and pitch the benefits to the prospects, then asking permission, discovery, um, and closing. Now, with, with the introduction, some do's and don'ts, please don't ask people, how are you today? It is so overused and it just makes it sound like a telemarketing call. But you do want to ask them for help, and I'll come to that in a minute. Then you come to the elevator pitch. This is about you. It needs to be two or maybe three sentences, very short, snappy. It needs to resonate with them and give them a reason to continue in the conversation with you. Uh, you can't have a what I call a vanilla elevator pitch. So if you're an accountant, for instance, if you phoned in, if you phoned uh, a prospect and said, hi, I'm an accountant, we can do your books for you. It's just not compelling. Uh, every accountant can do that. So you've got to work, find a way to be compelling and to resonate with, with those people. Um, it's about your, your prospect too, uh, and rather than about you. So what do they get out of working with you? Then asking permission to, uh, to go on and ask them questions. Discovery, uh, which is where you uncover where, where the, where the, where the, whether they have pain and where that pain is. And I love this, dig deep and find a fit. If you do find a fit, then you then you then move on and ask them to, to come to a meeting. So let's just step, step through this very uh, quickly, um, one at a time. Here's a couple of examples of an introduction and elevator pitch. I've got two examples here and I'll just run through them. One is for a debtor finance company and one is for a company that installs coffee machines. So the way that we run this internally is, is very much on this uh, line. So I'm gonna speak it because I think when you read it, it doesn't necessarily sound right. It's not meant to be read. It's meant to be spoken. So this would be, hello, Bob. It's Richard Forrest from XYZ. I wonder if you can help me out for a moment. 
they say yes, probably hesitantly, but they'll say yes. I was just wondering if you'd be open to looking at some new or different ways to improve your cash flow significantly. Or I'm just, I'm just wondering if you'd be open at looking at some different ways around improving staff productivity. So you say it slowly and calmly. It's not pushy. It's asking for permission. They say yes. So in the first example with the debtor finance, look, we're a let me just move these uh, slightly. We're a debtor finance company. We help companies that are struggling to get their customers to pay them on time. And what we do is we give them access to funds as soon as an invoice is raised, rather than them having to wait 30 or 60 days for payment. Now you can't just stop there because if you stop there, um, you, you lose control and you give the person the opportunity to say, oh, look, no, I'm not interested. I'll come to what you say when you get to the end of this in the next slide. For the coffee um, machine company, this is an interesting one because it's not actually about <clears throat> giving giving staff um, good coffee in the uh, in the in the company. It's about productivity. So we'd say we help companies increase their staff productivity and motivation by installing our coffee machines in their kitchen, giving them access to great coffee at work, and stopping them from constantly having to go and spend time out, going out to a coffee van or a nearby coffee shop throughout the day. Um, and again, what you'll see there is we're using help. There's a couple of sentences. We've kept it succinct and we've told them the reason for the call. So it's professional. It's not pushy. The next part is probably the next part of this uh, is, is for me is the key to uh, what you do. And this is where you segue into discovery. So if you imagine most telemarketing calls, when you get the, the introduction part, what the person does then is they go on and talk and they start getting pushed. We can do all these things for you. Our approach, the approach that I recommend is completely the opposite of that. And this is something that I've learned from a guy called Ari Galpa in his Unlock the Game program, which is very good if you want to go and have a look at it. So having said, um, we're a debtor finance company. We help companies who are struggling to get the customers to pay on time. We give them access to funds as soon as an invoice is raised, rather than them having to wait for 30 or 60 days for payment. Now, I don't know enough about your situation to know if something like this would make sense for you. Would it be okay if I ask you a couple of quick questions? It's so disarming. It's so genuine. Um, and it's very different from the approach that most people take. You're going to get one of three answers from this. The answer is going to be, no, not interested. And that's fine. If they're really not interested, that's fine. Or you're going to go, look, I'm really busy right now. Can you call me back on Thursday? Yep, OK, I can do that. Call them when they've got more time. Or you're going to get a yes. Uh, but it takes all the pressure out of the sales call. And it allows you to move really nicely into the discovery section of the conversation. And here uh, I've got some examples of some, of some questions, but I'm also going to talk about what you need to do. So when you get into discovery, what you're trying to do is uncover the pain that the client has that you can solve for them. So you want to use open questions wherever possible. By open, I mean all the ones that don't normally result in a yes or no answer. So things like why, what, where, when, how, all of those questions and who. Um, why? You've got to be a little careful with why, because it can be a bit antagonistic if it's not used the right way. Uh, but use open questions to get the person talking. Ask them about the issues that they may be experiencing that your product or service can fix. Um, and this is my favorite. <clears throat> Act dumb and dig deep. It's when somebody says to you, yeah, says to you yes, I do have a, that, that problem. And you say, oh, right. So what does that mean to you? Um, what, what's that doing for, your, for, for the productivity of your team? And going in and asking those somewhat dumb questions, but digging, digging deep because it allows the prospect to open up. So it's really driving me nuts. The more emotional involvement you get from them, the better. You're, and so you're looking for not just the company's pain, but also the individual's pain. Yeah, it's taking, I'm, I'm here at work till nine o'clock at night on a Friday because of this issue. Um, so it's all about finding their pain points. Are they living with an issue that you can solve? And uh, what, can, what can you bring to the party to, to help them? <clears throat> so um, when we first started out as an organization back in 2006, we, we did a lot of work for business coaches. And business coaches um, look for pain in three areas, time, team, and money. So money, then the, the business owner is not earning enough. 
uh, team, they can't build one around them, and time, they're working long hours. So we had questions in all three of those sections. And we'd start with something general, which might be, what's your biggest challenge right now? And you know, people would tend to go, well, you know, it's just business, which doesn't really help us. So we'd move into either time, team, or money. And here are some examples of the questions we would ask um, to, to, to delve into time. Because if you think about it, business owners, small business owners, any business owners, somewhat wear a badge of honor that they're working long hours or they believe it's just the way it has to be so you have to get beyond that so questions like how many hours do you work each week well if they say 40 there's no pain really it was unlikely to be any pain in time and we move to one of the other areas but if they say 65 70 with pride um so we dig deeper so how many evenings and weekends do you work right now uh, yeah i work most saturdays okay I mean, um, and how do you feel about that well, yeah, it's just, it goes with the territory. Great, great. Okay. So, John, do you have a family? Yeah, I do. How do they feel about the kind of hours that you're working? Now, that's a harder question to answer. Well, you know, they're supporting me because I've got this business and I'm trying to build it up for the future. Okay, okay. Um, but is your work taking away from time that you should really be spending with your partner or your family, watching your kids at sport, that sort of thing? Well, yes, it is. So what's stopping you from working fewer hours? Well, I just I don't have the team around me. Okay. And what happens when you take a holiday? I haven't taken a holiday for three years. Okay. So what would it mean to you if you could get more time back and take a holiday when you wanted to? Now, you take somebody through that, <clears throat> through that conversation and they've said the responses that I've said. That's a very powerful question at the end. And they'd be nuts not to say, it, would, it would, would mean a lot to me. It would make a big difference to my life. So you've got to have um, compelling questions that are going to help them see that, it, that the next step with you should be about meeting up. It's the next logical thing. It means the close to the call becomes really straightforward. And so you move to the close and you say, well, Bob, based on what you've, you've told me, you're working really long hours. You're looking to get some of that time back to spend with your, your family. And that's exactly what we can help you achieve. It might make sense for you to meet with one of our senior consultants just to have a look at your current situation and what we could do for you if you'd be open to that. And if you walk somebody through this process, the next they're going to say yes. OK, when would be a good time for you? So it's really gentle. The whole approach is gentle. It's a conversation between two business people. It's not a pushy sales call. And you generate a real rapport. And when you go to sales meetings, when you've used this approach, the rapport you've got with that, that uh, business decision maker is really strong. And it's a great platform to jump off uh, into your meeting. So having done that, you think, OK, that's it. I've, I've run my script, I've got through to the end of the, the, the I think tick, everything's done brilliant, but there's one other thing you need to think about, and that is qualification. Because you want either you or your sales team to be spending time with the right prospects and not with any prospect. So there are people who are not going to be right for you, even though they say, yes, I'd like to meet. So in the business coach example, some business coaches would say, you know, um, I don't really want to work. I don't want an appointment with a business that's turning over less than half a million dollars because they just can't afford my business. So we would need to qualify that, uh, qualify people in or out based on that. And I'll talk about that in a second. So what you're looking to do is to qualify out those who aren't right for you. In my opinion, most of the time you can do this after you've closed, but you can also do it before as part of your discovery if you feel more comfortable with that. Um, you qualify out those who aren't right with you. That might be questions, questions such as well, what or who are they using right now? Because if you're in a market and your biggest competitor is SAP, for instance, and you know that if somebody's using SAP, they're never going to move from that platform, ask them, what are you using right now? What system are you using right now? I'm using Excel for all of my worksheets. Brilliant. That's great. Um, how long have they got their, had their current solution in place? So if they bought a product or service like yours um, two weeks ago, unless they're really, really unhappy with it, it's very unlikely they're going to um, change game now if they've had to invest time and money in onboarding that other product. But if they've had it for six years and they've got frustrations, it's, it's, that's good. 
Are they under contract? And if so, when does it expire? So if they're under contract and it expires on the 1st of July, you might go, look, rather than meeting now, let's meet up in February, March next year, when you can start to build a relationship with them and it's more relevant for them. What's their current order size and frequency? So in other words, are they going to spend um, as much as you would like them to and order often enough for them to be a worthwhile prospect for you? Because your, your objective here is to bring on good prospects, good, good sales and good clients, not just anybody who can buy from you. You may want to ask them how many staff they've got. So in other words, um, if you're an office fit out company, how many staff do you have relates to the size of office space they've got? Um, what's their turnover? You might think that you can't ask this. It's a very sensitive question, and you, it, but you can ask it. We did for many years. Um, it's the last question you ask, not the first. And the easy way to ask it is to give people ranges. So um, can you tell me, is your turnover less than a million between one and five million or five to ten million? Um, don't lead them to the one that you want them to give. So don't say, is your turnover over a million dollars? Because they'll go, well... I suppose if I say if I say no, I won't get the meeting and um, just give them those band ranges. But what you're doing is you're making sure that the leads that your prospector develops for you and provides to your sales team are valuable and they're the right um, prospects for you. So a couple of examples um, with with this uh, where it can go wrong. Uh, we did some work for a company that installed high bay lights in warehouses and they said to us, we just need people who've got 40 or more high bay lights. So when we were talking to people, we we're saying these are more energy efficient, et cetera, save you on your energy bill, how many high bay lights do you have? And I remember a phone call from the sales manager saying, just been to a, um, an appointment, which was a complete dud. I say, I said, was it the size of, was it the number of high bay lights? It wasn't big enough. He said, no, it wasn't that at all. So what was it? He said, the guy never turns them on. Okay. Right, so we now, <clears throat> we now need to make a question about, do you switch your, um, your lights on that, that makes that appointment good? So you will have to refine things as you go out to your appointments. You'll get to know things as you go through those and learn what qualification questions need to be asked to make sure you've got the best possible appointments. Now, the next thing you need to do is to know your metrics and to set expectations. Now, whether this is you making the calls or it's somebody in your team, there are a couple of things I would say. Firstly, if it's you, make it your first priority every day. Uh, if it's somebody else, make it their only job. Because if you give somebody two, other, two jobs to do, one of which is cold calling, they will always do the other job first, even if it's something like throwing themselves in, self, themselves in sulfuric acid. They'll still do that before they do the, their cold calls. So give them only one responsibility, and that's what they do, and they do that first. If it's you, do it first, get it out of the way, and then move on to other things. It is always the thing that gets pushed back. Um, in terms of the hours that you want to work, I would suggest you want to be doing every single day some cold calling of this nature, some prospecting. If it's you doing the calling, one hour might be all you can fit in, then that's what you should do. If you're hiring somebody or you have somebody who's going to be doing this, in most cases, four hours is um, a good amount of time. Eight hours is a long time for somebody to spend on the phone. There are some people who can do it, but it is very tiring. Four hours means they get they work in the morning, they get the afternoon off. They work, they get the morning off, they work in the afternoon. They're a school, they're, they're picking up and dropping off school kids. So they come in and they start at 10, they finish at two, something like that. Four hours a day is a good amount of, of work. And if somebody's working four hours a day, they'll put you in front of about five, your company in front of about 5,000 uh, organizations every year. So the number of calls they make. And there are some variations with these numbers, uh, but they should be making between 15 and 20 phone calls per hour. Um, if they're having long conversations, then that number is going to drop. If they're having short conversations, that number is going to go up. They won't speak to the decision maker on every single one of their calls because that decision maker will be in a meeting, on the phone, out of the office, busy and can't take the call right now. So, But they should be speaking to between four and eight decision makers per hour. So out of that 15 to 20 phone calls, somewhere between four and eight conversations and see what the numbers are. Again, if they're having long conversations that, um, and they're generating a large number of appointments, that number of conversations will be at the lower end. If they're having very short conversations, that number will be at the higher end. Conversion rate is the percentage of those conversations that result in a, a qualified sales lead for your sales team. 
it can be generally it's between about five and 20 percent. Um, I think our average is about five percent um, across all our campaigns, but we've got some very difficult ones where it takes us maybe 30 or 40 hours to generate an appointment. And we've got some that are very quick where it takes us 45 minutes, somewhere between five and 20 percent. The less you need the appointment to be qualified, the more people will fit the qualification criteria, the more highly qualified, the lower the conversion rate. So you need to work out what is right for your business. You don't probably want to go at the loose end, which is just dropping by for a cup of coffee. Um, but you maybe don't want to go for highly qualified to start with. Let's get some people in, work out what's working and then tighten things up as you go. And the last thing is the prospect quality side of things. And that's a constant working out. We, you're calling a list of manufacturing today and you, it's all working well. And then you change, change to targeting retail companies. You have to look at the prospect quality again um, and just make sure that you keep refining those, those qualities and those criteria for you. Um, it's going through. So my second last slide, you'll be glad to hear, is all about being consistent, just reminding you of this, it is a long term strategy. In most cases, you're engaging people much earlier in the sales cycle than you normally would. Occasionally, your prospector will call, call somebody who says, actually, we're looking at that right now. If you can get a proposal to me by five o'clock today, you're in the you're, you're in the running. But those are unusual. Most of the time you're engaging them early. So instead of them looking online, you've called them and they're going, actually, I do have a problem with this. Let me meet with the person, the salesperson. They meet with you. And they go, this sounds good. Let me go and talk to my colleagues internally. These are the things that they've normally done prior to going online to look for a solution. So you have to walk them through that. So at FMG, with leads that come to us over the phone and from the website, um, typically a prospect will convert in between two and four weeks. But when we go out and we do our lead generation, our, our lead generation for ourselves, prospecting, Typically, it takes about 90 to 100 days, so it's a lot longer process. So you have to keep it going daily. You need to set time and set uh, aside daily, and you've got to take a long-term um, view. Generally, when we survey our uh, clients, the ones that are getting the best results are the ones who have been doing it for about 10 months or more, because you're, they start getting sales at about month three, four, five, depending on the product, um, but they're really hitting their straps by about month, month 10. Remember that 70-80% um, of the prospects you speak to will be people for the future. So follow-up is vital. These are the people who say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm under contract at the moment for another three years, so I'm not going to do anything. Or I'm interested, but not until the new financial year, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, combining your phone calls with, um, with digital marketing is a really good idea. The digital marketing, your offers and your newsletters don't need to be too regular. Once every two or three months is really good for keeping people warm. Uh, and what it does is it keeps them warm. So if something changes in their environment and they go, actually, I need to do something about this, you're top of mind and they reach out to you. Your phone calls should also occur. And they're the ones who, who um, where you can find out where that prospect is in the sales process. So keep that follow up happening. And remember, there's a really great stat um, about 80%, sorry, 70% of warm leads leak out of your database or out of a database every year and out of your sales pipeline. But 80% of those people will buy your product or service at some point in the future. You know, the question is, will it, will it be you? So if you keep them warm in your database, you're holding on to those people, you're much more likely to get those sales. So combine your digital marketing with the phone calls. You can't replace with uh, you can't use newsletters and things to replace your phone calls, but it means it keeps you top of mind with them all the time. And one of the things I, I think is you can use discovery um, every time this discovery process, every time you meet somebody new, you can use it to find out whether it's at a barbecue or networking or that sort of thing. Um, find out, do they work for a company that's a potential client? Who's the decision maker? Is it the person you're talking to or somebody else in the organization? What solution are they all are currently using? What type of prospect are they in terms of account value to your organization? When are they likely to buy? It's good practice. It's actually quite good fun. It's a great way to have a conversation focusing on the other person at a networking event. So I've run through an awful lot today. Um, we've got some time, I believe, for questions, if there are any. Um, I'm happy to answer those. I will just jump on a slide and say, whoops, a slide and say, um, I, as uh, was said earlier, I wrote a book about um, 
B2B sales prospecting. Very happy to provide anybody who wants one with a free copy. Um, uh, I've, I've been told they're very good for, for insomniacs. They put people to sleep at night when they're struggling other ones. But seriously, I'm very happy to provide people with a copy if they'd like one. Uh, if there is uh, anybody who wants to get a copy, please reach out to Stephen or AEML or directly to me. Um, so a couple of questions. Thank you very much. How has COVID affected the way we conduct sales presently? Um, it's harder to attract or acquire larger new contract details without face-to-face -face meetings. Yeah, look, I, yeah, absolutely right. A phone call is only that first step. Um, it allows you to uh, engage with that person and to set up maybe an online meeting. Um, I think if you're selling, uh, I think there's two things to, to think about there. One is your personal preference, and that's important, which it sounds like is face-to-face. -face. Uh, and the other is um, what the, the sales prospect is thinking. If you've got a large purchase, um, they probably are going to want to meet face-to-face. -face. Um, so the phone call is absolutely the first step. Um, and then Zoom and face-to-face -face after that. What I can say about COVID, though, in another area is that people are still buying. Uh, what we have found in our lead generation from our lead generation stats is that before we went into lockdown, about 50, it was 50-50 split where the appointments we set came from the first conversation with the de decision maker compared with a subsequent, second or subsequent conversation with them, not call, but conversation. During lockdown, that switched to 79-21, uh, um, where 79% of those appointments were coming from the subsequent conversation with decision makers. So people are still buying, but they're taking time to make those decisions. I think um, you really need to be face to face with people. I, per, my personal preference, I find uh, online meetings tougher. I prefer to be face to face with prospects. Um, uh, somebody who said, uh, my company specializes in remediation projects, mainly in construction at city councils. We have difficulty pitching ourselves when other comp competitors have been the sole provider for many years. Yes, yeah, so, <clears throat> um, I, I, yes, okay, sorry. What, what you're saying, any tips on how to break through those B2B relationships besides cutting your prices? And that's absolutely such a vital question. And I'm really glad you asked that. Um, when you go in and you're talking to prospects on this and you're coming up with your pitch, it should never be about saving prices because all that does is drive the price to the, to the, to the lowest uh, de not common denominator. Uh, and, and that doesn't benefit anybody at all. So the approach that we always take is, OK, what are the problems that those companies may be experiencing with their current suppliers? So I can't I need to know a bit more about um, your business, but let me take one for logistics, for example. Um, so if we were calling companies about logistics, they're using a supplier. They don't have all of their products sitting in a warehouse thinking, gosh, how do I get this shipped overseas or how do I get it brought into Australia? They're already using somebody. So the questions we would ask are, how often are you facing, this may be a little bit um, biased at the moment, but how often are you facing delays in, in shipping, d shipments arriving, coming in late? What's that doing to the rest of your business? Is it giving you supply chain supply chain problems? How how long are um, your shipments sitting in cost customs and causing you to have to pay large fees because they're not being cleared because the paperwork's not right? So what we're doing is digging into the pain points, the likely prob problems that those clients have. So whatever your business, you've got to think about, OK, if somebody was using one of my competitors, what could be going wrong? What are the things that we do really well that we can talk to uh, prospects about? And, and as you said, uh, what was the word? Uh, breaking down that, um, that B2B relationship that they've always got. You won't always do it because they may have a very strong, very happy relationship. What you're looking for is the ones who don't have that and are experiencing problems and pain in that area. And that's where you can start to go in and say, what's happening here? What's happening there? Why is that, is that causing problems in other parts of the business? Right. Who else is getting upset with these delays? Well, yeah, I've got my boss on my back all the time about this. Great. Well, it sounds like you're looking to do this, this, and this. And I think we could really help you here. How about we set up a time to meet? And then you get in and talk to them. But as you say, it's not about uh, money. Um, hi, I'm a building biologist in New South Wales, non-binding contracts with local GPs for mold testing. Um, how do I get a go about? Yeah. 
How do I go about getting a list of new prospects to potentially reach out to versus manually doing it through Google search, which is what I tend to do now? Is it something that we provide? No, we don't provide lists, but the list brokers I talked to uh, talked about earlier do. So if you go to um, uh, Jacob at Impact Lists, um, they Impact Lists are our preferred supplier of lists. They have their own database called Reach DM. And Jacob is very, he's very uh, professional, he's very good, very quick turnaround. Um, and ask him for a list of the ANSIC codes. You'll be able to get, you'll be able to identify um, the medical um, practitioners, med medical surgeries. So have a conversation with a, a list broker and say, I want to target, um, uh, you know, I think you said local GPs. Um, how do I get that? How many have you got? Because when you talk to a list broker, you can say, look, I want to talk to uh, medical practices with five to 50 staff. Um, I want them to be in on the, on the northern beaches of Sydney. And uh, I want the, uh, who would you want? Practice manager or business owner, they may or may not have the practice manager uh, as, a, as the contact. And you can ask them for a count of those, and you can also ask them for a, a breakdown. So you might say, look, can you give me a count of that? And they come back and say, there's 500 for you, and it'll cost you 400, it's, it costs nothing for the count, it's 500. You could go back and say, can you give me a breakdown of the position, the job titles that you've got for them? And, and then you can go, actually, I don't want that, I don't want that, but I do want these. So what I would do is I'd go to those list brokers, happy to have a conversation with you separately about that if you need more information, but that's, that's the uh, other way, uh, to, that's the best way I think to do it. Once you've got the count, you can then refine it and then go, yeah, that's what I want. Please, can you supply it? And then they'll charge you for that. Tends to be about 90 cents per, uh, per record. Um, I have a cleaning product that I swear by and strongly advocate. We premiere at spe specific events, host special conferences, promote on social media, but you're saying classic uh, telesales and classic sales techniques are still the number one option. Um, no, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily the, the number one option. Uh, I think that it is an option that should be considered in your marketing mix. So if your events and, and everything else are working well and your social media are working well, or even if they're just working, I wouldn't stop those, but I would experiment on this. So you might go, well, actually, I don't want to go to end users. So I'm not phoning businesses and saying, here's my cleaning product. I'm talking to cleaning companies. So can I get a list of cleaning companies that I can go and talk to about the products they're using, maybe some issues they're finding. It's coming in from overseas, perhaps. And so they're not able to get the product, my product um, made lo locally. So don't have any problems with supply. Those could be really good. And also how effective it is uh, biologically. Uh, for the environment and things like that. So the only way to gauge the outcome is to do it. And the only way to do that is to do it for probably three or four months and see how it goes, but to do it in a structured way. But I would never say um, replace what you're doing now with what I'm saying. I think it's a really good additional channel for you. Um, and I, I would never hesitate to pick up the phone to talk to somebody. Um, I wouldn't rely just on emails. I would always get a conversation going because you build rapport, you build relationships, and you build you build really great clients from it. Uh, I think that's the end of the questions. Hopefully, I've answered those. Uh, my email address is richard at fmgroup.com.au. Uh, richard at f for forest, m for marketing group.com.au. So if anybody does want to reach out with questions, very happy to do that. You probably find our phone new. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you very much for uh, letting me present Stephen and the team. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed that today. If anybody wants a, a copy of my book, wants to email me, wants a conversation, please reach out, very happy to, to have a chat. Um, and thank you very much for listening today.